Time is our currency. We have to spend it well and know that I am fighting right alongside of you to figure out how we can do just that. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Something I love about being a podcaster is getting the chance to support my network of fellow creators and business owners. Being Boss, hosted by Emily Thompson, is an exploration of not only what it means, but what it takes to be boss as a creative business owner, a freelancer, or side hustler. Being Boss is another amazing resource for anyone interested in getting inspired and more importantly, getting started. If you like Gold Digger, trust me, you are going to love Being Boss. Emily even covers topics that are near and dear to our Gold Digger hearts, like taking time off as an entrepreneur and finding vision for your business and life. Listen to Being Boss wherever you get your podcasts. So before we dive into the strategies, I just want to share a tiny bit of research for all of the multitaskers out there or for the people who finish their day and they feel like they're not totally sure what it is that they actually accomplished. I'm raising my hand for both of those camps. (laughs) Feeling split in two is something that I felt since Coco entered my world, but now I feel like I'm split in three between my kids and my business. And one of the greatest battles that I faced in this so-called juggle is this fight for presence. It's like we all want to be more present and we start getting stressed out that we're not being present enough. And it's like when I'm with my kids, I just want to be all in. I want to be focused on them, not thinking about work. And when I'm working, I want to spend my time wisely on the things that actually move the needle and not be thinking about my kids. And what happens is when I try to mix the two with multitasking, I basically feel like I'm failing at both or that I'm wasting time or that I'm not actually getting anything done. Like, have you ever felt that way? Well, there's this reason that multitasking leaves us feeling inefficient and frazzled. And let me tell you, I have heard this research over and over and over again, and yet I still fall into the trap of believing that I am capable of multitasking. But studies show us that multitasking is actually really ineffective and we're more likely to make a mistake and take way longer to do anything when we attempt to do two or more things at the same time. Get this. Only 2.5% of people are even capable of truly being able to multitask, whereas the majority of humans are actually wired to be monotaskers or wired to only be able to focus on one thing at a time. When we think that we're multitasking, we're actually task switching at this rapid pace, which can be confusing for our brains to manage, and it leads to sloppier work, lower retention, and at least for me, a heck of a lot of less joy with whatever it is that I'm trying to focus my attention on. Like, I absolutely hate feeling super rushed or behind on things, but at the same time, there's something to be said about the ability to get more done when you're strategic about your time. The days when I have fewer items on my to-do list and more flexibility or more time to kind of flow through my day and do whatever, whenever, those actually tend to be my less productive days than the ones where I know I only have a two-hour chunk or a nap time window to finish X, Y, or Z. Like when I became a mom a few years ago, I realized just how much I could accomplish in a three-hour window between nursing my efficiency literally increased. Like I feel like it increased tenfold and the way that I looked at time totally transformed. That's because when we have these boundaries with our time, we're able to use it way more wisely. We're able to focus our efforts and our attention on one thing rather than trying to figure out what to do and swapping tasks throughout the day without a plan. And if you're one of those people where this was me, you get to the end of the day and you're like, I don't know where time went. I don't actually know what I did. You find yourself like not actually progressing forward in any substantial way. Then I highly recommend taking a little bit of time and doing an actual audit of your time to keep track of where and what you're spending your time on all day. Now, this might sound extra, but I really encourage you to try it and just see how it goes. 
You can literally track and write down your hour by hour routine for like two or three days, starting from the time you wake up all the way to the time you go to bed. Like keep track of how much time you spend on everything from getting ready for the day, making meals, doing household chores, working on various tasks for your job, even extracurricular things like exercise or happy hour with friends. I always encourage myself and my team, like keep a log of what you do when, even the times that you might get distracted or attempt to multitask. And I have a feeling that it might just reveal some surprising data that will help you to start seeing potential gaps, inefficiencies, and opportunities for you to create better boundaries with your time. I want for you to use this like time audit idea and the data that comes with it and then couple it with what I'm going to share in the rest of today's episode so that you can feel more in control of your time each day and that you can trust that you're using your time to steward the life and the schedule that you desire rather than feeling like you're always behind or you don't have enough time to do everything you wish you could do. So let's dive on in to tip number one and hear me out before you shut this episode off. Tip number one is this, wake up just a little bit earlier. Now, as a sleep deprived mom, sleep is foundational in my life. And I am not at all saying you need to get up at four in the morning, but I am telling you that maybe just 10 or 15 extra minutes in the morning could be what you need to start the day on the right foot and to help you get clear on your priorities for the day while waking up in a less urgent way. Now, I am someone who literally sleeps by the baby monitor, and that is usually my wake-up call, and there are absolutely seasons of life where that is going to happen, but if you are in a place where you can wake up just a little bit earlier, like 15 extra minutes a day is nearly two extra hours per week of time that you can use for whatever it is that you're seeking more of whether it's journaling or reading or doing a little face mask or sneaking in sun salutations or mindfully brewing your precious cup of coffee. Notice that I'm not necessarily saying you need to spend this time working, but just setting yourself up. I feel like our mornings are so critical. Maybe you wish you felt a little less unorganized. You could use that time to write down a quick plan or a to-do list for your day. Or maybe you hate feeling rushed. Use those 15 minutes to get yourself ready or to prepare things for your kids before they wake up. Do you wish you could feel maybe less tension throughout your day? Start off your day with a short stretch and a meditation. Well, I'm a huge proponent of using our mornings intentionally and creating a little more time to kick off your day on the right foot. I am so not about doing this at the detriment of your sleep quality. Like I firmly, like in my heart of hearts, believe that if you want to have a great day, it starts with a great night's sleep. So if you're a person who can limp along through your day after just four or five hours of not super restful sleep, then I want for you to start here and focus on getting at least seven hours of good quality sleep. We are kind of crazy about sleep. Like we are hyper aware of the quality of our sleep and have been actually trying to be super consistent with going to bed early so that we can get up just a little bit earlier. And actually 90% of the time, Drew and I, we like naturally just wake up early. If we had it our way, we'd be in bed every night by 9 p.m., sleeping by 9.30 after reading to unwind. That's like our dream world, and it's something that we prioritized a lot before we became a family of four. I feel like in my final stages of pregnancy, we would high-five ourselves as we were like getting into bed at 9 o'clock. And I was telling myself I was like banking up on sleep, which we all know is not an actual thing, but... Since we're the kind of people we hate alarm clocks, we have learned how to kind of set our body clocks. And we also totally trust our toddler to wake us up slightly before 7 a.m. saying, mommy, daddy, Coco out of bed, please. So, you know, it's different scenarios, but I just want to really focus in on just even starting your day with a little bit of peace can really, really set the stage for how it unfolds. Now, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, my sleep is terrible, some proven ways to improve your sleep include aiming to go to bed around the same time every night, avoiding screens and blue light at least an hour before going to bed, avoiding caffeine and naps later in the day, and keeping your bedroom cool, dark, and quiet while you sleep. 
We literally have gone as extreme as using little face masks. We have really great blackout shades. We've also thoughtfully invested in sheets, pillows, and blankets that we love making bed feel like this like precious escape every night. So if you have not updated your bedding since college, here is your reminder. You are a grown up and you deserve to love how you are sleeping. Okay, number two is this. Set screen time and phone limits. So it's pretty obvious, but one of our biggest distractions and time sucks of our modern age are these things that we carry with us literally everywhere, even the bathroom, which is our phones. Like, have you ever caught yourself where you're just avoiding a task or you're dreading something and instead of facing it, you take a little quote break by grabbing your phone without a second thought. And before you know it, you find yourself 20 minutes later scrolling around on social media. It happens to all of us, and it's super easy when we're constantly having our phones with us or on our desks. They're basically just sitting there taunting us, right? They're like telling you like you're missing something or somebody might be trying to get a hold of you or did you respond to that yet? And for me, someone with a neurodivergent brain, my phone can be the ultimate time thief if I'm not careful or if I'm not mindful about it. So get this, this stat literally makes me want to throw up, but Americans check their phones on average 262 times per day. That is once every five and a half minutes. And that's like five and a half minutes when we're talking about like not our sleep hours. Like that stat is wild to me. 262 times a day we're looking at our phones. And on top of that, we spend on average nearly three and a half hours actually on our phones each day. That's crazy, right? But it's like when we think about it, it's not all that unbelievable. So much of our information lives on these devices that come with us everywhere from our email to the news, social media to music, connection with family and friends, text messages, phone calls. Like it is no wonder that we're so attached to them and that they serve as this distraction when we'd really benefit by focusing our attention elsewhere. Drew and I talk about this all the time, but Like when we were kids, we would get bored and then we would get creative, whether, you know, it was going out back and building a dam in the stream or making like a pillow fort. And kids these days aren't used to getting bored because they're so distracted because they use screens too. And it's just something as parents that I think it's super hard to watch happen, but it's also like our kids are watching us. So what are they seeing when they're looking at us? So It's a conundrum and it's something I don't have the answers for. But if you want to create more time in your day, it can happen pretty simply by eliminating or putting limits on your own screen time and how often you allow yourself to peruse your phone. So Drew and I realized a couple of years ago, I would say now it's probably been five years that we'd get into bed at night and we'd sit on our phones and we used to do this all the time. We would literally just sit in bed together, scroll mindlessly rather than connecting with each other at the end of the day or doing something way more restorative for ourselves like reading. And it clicks like, hey, we don't want to spend our time together at night that way. And we also don't want that to be the thing that we fall asleep to or wake up to. So we designated a little corner in our kitchen and that is where we charge our phones. Our bedroom is a no phone zone. And so we literally plug our phones into a cabinet in our kitchen at dinner time. And then they are out of sight, out of mind for the rest of the evening. And one, it really helps wind us down to get better sleep. But two, having them in this designated location, it's like if we start walking over there, the other person can call you out, right? Like they're like holding you accountable of like, I know why you're in that corner of the kitchen. What are you doing? Like what's so important right now? And so for me, like I have to have that really hard boundary and not having our phones in our bedroom, it doesn't really tempt me. Like it means that I'm not going to wake up in the middle of the night and zombie scroll away. They are on a different floor in our house and that's where they stay. So maybe you have way more self-control than I do, whether you trust yourself to hold yourself accountable or you decide to designate a zone where your phones can live and stay for a portion of the day, creating some sort of expectation around when and how you're using screens can save you a lot of time and can help you to stay focused. And one thing I love about how we charge our phones downstairs is then in the morning, like when I get cocoa up, like I haven't even touched my phone yet. 
Nothing has been urgent. I get to spend time with her getting her ready for school in the morning and things like that. And it's just a much more peaceful way to start the day. And I found that like, I don't even touch my phone until like 9, 10 AM. And it really does just kind of impact one, how I start my day, but two, how I prioritize what needs to get done. So Maybe you don't mind sleeping next to your phone, but you do know it's a major distraction when you try to sit down and do deep work in your afternoons, or maybe it's the thing that's keeping you from starting the day the way that you actually want to as you jump onto your email and your Instagram the second your eyes open. But my challenge for you is just to take a little bit of time, examine your own phone habits, and ask someone in your life for a little bit more accountability if this is truly an area where you're struggling with. You can build in boundaries in either where you place your phone somewhere else for a period of time, have somebody hide it from you, set it on do not disturb mode during times you need to focus, or even through setting limits on specific apps that suck you in. Like your phone can literally shoot up reminders that your time is being spent on your screen. So if you need that extra accountability, I highly encourage you to get it. One of the things is, is if we want to get more time and we're not sure where to start, Literally open up your settings on your phone and look at your screen time report and see that data for yourself and think about all the time that you're spending on that device. We've been through so many adventures together from the first episode to now over 500 episodes. Growing the Gold Digger podcast, I can't help but see the similarities between how I grew up too. The first day of school feelings, the awkward braces years and the excitement for what's next. And I know I'm not alone here. Growing a business takes a lot, and a HubSpot CRM platform is here to help your business grow better. HubSpot's reporting dashboard is like your crystal ball, giving you this bird's eye view on your marketing, sales, and customer service performance so that you can get ahead of any issues before they happen. Automated marketing tools allow you to create robust campaigns across all of your marketing channels, and you can even send, test, and optimize emails for different devices and inboxes. And shared inboxes make incoming chats and emails easy to manage and scale for the whole team. Learn more about how a HubSpot CRM platform can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. Everything can shift in five days. Are you down to shift with me? Email lists are the key to growing your business online. And if you've listened to even one episode of this podcast, you probably already know this. Getting started though? Well, it's awkward and a little scary. And I was there not too long ago. But now I get to pop into a quarter million inboxes every single week because I decided to simply start at zero. Are you starting at zero or maybe restarting an email list that's been collecting virtual dust? Well, I've got a challenge for you. My absolutely free zero to 250 email list challenge. It's just five days with me. All the strategies that you need to get you from zero to 250 subscribers on your email list. There's tutorials. It's a mini course and you can join today at listbuildchallenge.com. You could reach 250 inboxes and more. You've just got to start. Start your five days of the zero to 250 challenge at listbuildchallenge.com. Okay, number three is something a little more recent for me, but something I am loving. So set a timer for focused work. So I already referenced like, I don't love feeling like pressure or urgency, like in the form of deadlines, but I will say that there is something super powerful about giving yourself some sort of time frame to work on something or to focus on doing as much as you can within this short little window of time. So I'm not talking about like having this big work assignment or this big project or this big thing that you want to do around the house and saying, okay, I'm going to give myself all week to do it. I'm talking like 20 to 30 minute increments to get something started or to finish a task that you've been putting off. Now you could extend it. If you're like 20 or 30 minutes, it's not going to get me anywhere. Trust me, it will. But if you're like, I need an hour, an hour and a half, fine. Take what you need, but listen to this. Studies actually suggest that the maximum our brains can focus on one task is 90 minutes at a time before we need a 15 minute break. 90 minutes, that is the maximum. So dedicating a day or a week to getting one thing checked off of your list, even if it is a really big thing, isn't actually motivating for your brain to conceptualize getting something done. 
This is exactly why we often delay starting something or wait until the very last minute because we make a task out to be bigger or harder or more time consuming than it actually is. And in doing that, it paralyzes us from actually taking any action. So how the heck do we combat this? We combat it by breaking down what you need to do in chunks and tackling it piece by piece in smaller windows of time. And I will tell you, take it a step further, have a timer handy to keep you accountable to what your brain is able to really do. It is literally amazing that when you give yourself a smaller deadline to focus on completing one thing and one thing only, how quickly you're actually able to get certain things done, whether it's the stack of bills in your drawer or putting your laundry away or writing that one email, setting a timer and simply taking focus action can quickly move the needle and yield results. Not to mention, it can help you release that guilt and that stress that you feel when you put things off that you know that you should be doing. Now, while this idea might lead you to believe that maybe having a timer set would make you feel frantic or rushed, in reality, you're giving yourself the freedom within this time window to fully focus your attention, your efforts, and your energy on a specific task, and in a way that allows you to actually progress where you might be prone to procrastinating. So I got one of these hourglass timers on my desk. It's exactly 20 minutes. And when I'm really struggling with focusing or putting off doing something that I find myself avoiding, I'll flip that thing over and use that timer to focus and get things done. There are also timers online. If you Google the Pomodoro timer or even just use a timer on your phone, I want for you to incorporate this and just try it out. Like promise me, you'll just give it a try. You can set it. Exit out of all your distractions, whether it's email or Slack, like put your phone in airplane mode and give yourself this ability to fully focus anywhere from 20, 30, all the way up to 90 minutes. And my advice here is to start with smaller increments of time because your focus is going to be sharpened the more that you do this. So don't set yourself up for failure and say, I'm going to sit here for 90 minutes and do this thing. Start small, check in with yourself. It's kind of like when you're dreading a workout and you get five minutes in and you're like, oh, okay, I feel good. I can keep going. Very similar to this. Our focus is something that we need to train. Okay. Number four is something Coco taught me. Prep for your day the night before. So did your mom ever like lay out your clothes before school when you were growing up? Or have you like packed your lunches the night in advance before work? There is something to be said about simplifying your days and the decisions that you have to make before that first cup of coffee hits. And something we've learned as parents is that Coco does really well when she knows exactly what to expect for the next day. So every night when I put her to bed, I'll share what the game plan is for the following day. And I'll do simple things like laying out her clothes or if she's going to take a bath, I'll have her towel ready or pack up her backpack, like all of these little things. And What's so cool about it is it helps her to wake up knowing what to expect and anticipating what the day is going to hold. And the funny thing is, is I was thinking about this, like, oh, she just does really well when we prepare her. And I was like, dude, so do you. I feel like we're really prone to do these certain preparations for other people, but we are quick to neglect to set ourselves up well for the next day. And it's funny because there are just so many little, small, seemingly quick tasks that ultimately drain a lot of our time and force us to make a ton of decisions before we're even fully awake. Things like picking out our clothes, planning what to eat or what to feed your family, getting kids stuff ready for school, even writing out your to-do list or priorities for the day. When we save all of these, quote, little things for the day of, they add up to take a lot of our time. That's like why we finish our day and we're like, I was moving all day. I swear I didn't even sit down, but I don't know what I got accomplished. So I want for you to consider what instead you could do maybe the night before, even if it's just one or two things that are going to eliminate some of those small decisions that you have to make in the morning. Like I found that the more I can prepare or know what I've got to tackle next, the more my brain can truly rest knowing that I've got a plan. Like whenever I wake up in the middle of the night and I have like a checklist in my brain of things I need to do, I'm like, okay, your planning is not working right now. Like you need to get these things out of your brain 
release them, trust that they're stored somewhere, whether it's on your computer or your phone or on a piece of paper. And I can tell that when I'm not preparing well, it does impact my stress levels. It impacts my ability to focus and it also impacts my ability to make decisions. So whether you lay out your clothes or prep your food or pack lunches or have your kids' school clothes ready or even just picking up the house at night so that you wake up and it feels refreshed the next morning, it is proven that we as humans get decision fatigue throughout the day. So anything that you can do to prepare a piece or two the night before can help for you to save yourself from trying to balance and make 100 decisions at the same time. And it can set you up for success and it can also save you time. Okay, number five is this. I'm about to sound like I'm contradicting myself, but hang with me. Number five is integrate things together. So we've already talked about we're not team multitask. I am likely not in the 2.5% of people that can multitask. And chances are you probably aren't either. But there are a few certain scenarios where I am a proponent of this idea, let's call it stacking or integrating certain activities to make the most of your time. So I recognize that like we as human beings cannot always compartmentalize all of the roles that we play or all the ways that we show up. And so when we can find ways to integrate things, it allows us to achieve a little bit more each day. Now, the key here is to integrate a no-brainer task with an educational yet hands-free task so that you're getting something productive done while challenging and expanding your knowledge. So things like listening to a podcast while you're doing the dishes or taking an online course in your ears on your commute or while you're out walking the dog or pushing the baby in the stroller or listening to audiobooks while you're in the shower. Now, here's the thing. Don't get this twisted in that I'm saying you need to fill every single minute of your day with enrichment and that you need to continue doing, doing, doing. We all have to rest. We deserve to rest. And that can look like just chilling out on your lawn chair. But if you're sitting there and you're like, hmm, I'm super relaxed and I have the capacity to take on something more, maybe you could listen to an audiobook or a podcast. So I want for you to just think about like your regular days where you don't have a ton of extra time for learning or pouring back into yourself or feeling inspired. This is an awesome way to learn on the go and knock out two important things at the same time. I mean, when I clean my closet, it has a totally different sort of energy if I'm doing it while I'm listening to a funny podcast or something that's inspiring me or an audiobook, you know? Now, the blessing here is that you can feel like you're getting new experiences and you can learn new things while checking off some of the nitty gritty menial tasks that we all need to get done, the things that we have to do, but the things that don't necessarily require our full brain power. Like, I don't know about you, but I get my best ideas in the shower and I love listening to audiobooks that make me think while I'm in the shower because I'm not distracted. I'm actually focused and I don't need to think too hard about shampooing my hair or putting soap on the loofah. So for me, like that's been something where it's like a way where I'm pouring into myself, but I'm not taking away from any other aspect of my life. Okay. The last one is this. Finally, number six, managing interruptions. So we've talked about screen time, but what other distractions are consistently pulling you out of the task at hand? Like I'll tell you that one of my most challenging things that I've had to navigate working from home as a mom is like taking my mom hat off and allowing myself to be in full business owner mode, even if it's for like one hour. Like it is so easy for me to hear the babies and want to run in or help or play. And as many of you know, it's just a juggle. Like mom guilt is real and it can be super distracting, especially when everyone's under the same roof. But first, I just want to say in case I haven't, it is 100% okay. And it is a lot of times necessary to let someone else come in and care for your kids. And it's also okay for you to give yourself the permission to spend some uninterrupted time on work non-apologetically. So a few things that have helped me are getting noise canceling earbuds. I listen to very Zen music. I'm talking like spa music. Most of the time I'm listening to spa music and I try to get my workspace ready in terms of things like water and snacks and chapstick or anything that would make me get up off of my desk to go get something else in the house. 
And I don't know about you, but if you have a toddler, if you've ever been through toddler stage, there were times where I would like literally have to hide in the closet or in the bathroom just to get some work done. Because if Coco knew where I was in the house, she would want to be with me, which is literally like the most special, but also the most heartbreaking thing, especially when you need to get something done. And so setting up your workspace to try to keep you separate is very, very helpful. And if you can find a space with a door that you can close so that people and pets are not pulling you out of your workflow, do that. I highly encourage it. And I mean, a lot of times I record my podcast in the closet away from everyone else. So I totally get it. One thing that I think is so critical, and I do this every single day, is I put my phone into do not disturb mode. And that has been so helpful for me because I can still see things. I wear an Apple watch so I can see if something's coming through that's actually urgent, which guess what? Never is. But if you can put your phone onto airplane mode or do not disturb mode, it is really, really a great way to stay focused. And the other thing that I would say that I would encourage you to do is try to only check emails at the beginning and the end of your day. One thing that happens is, is when we keep our email up, like we're constantly sitting there refreshing our inboxes, almost waiting for more work to come in. And what happens is, is if we respond to every email right away in the morning, we start these threads where there's tons of responses back and forth. And every single time we're in our inbox, it's taking us away from other work. So creating some sort of system or boundaries around how you are checking notifications, whether that's on your phone, your email, your social media, that can be a huge, huge, huge way to get more time. And one thing to remember, literally adopt this phrase into your life, breathe it over you. Their urgency is not my emergency, meaning you can do your best to get to everyone, to make sure everyone has what they need to respond to things in a timely manner, but you don't always have to be available or accessible, especially when you're juggling multiple things or you're trying to stay focused. For me, I recognize like it's up to me to do what I can to stay dialed into one task before moving on to something else or answering someone else because the time that it takes for me to refocus and pick back up after a distraction hits is a ton of wasted time. In fact, listen to this. A study found that it takes about 23 minutes to refocus after we're interrupted or distracted. So imagine if we planned ahead to intentionally set up our workspace in order to reduce our distractions. If we were able to plan out our communication to not always be available while we're trying to focus, there are just so many little ways that could absolutely help us get back time in our days, but also give us that beautiful feeling of finishing the day thinking, man, I just crushed it. I got so much done. Now, for me, in this season of life, like time is absolutely my most valuable currency. And I have to imagine that if you're listening to this, time is pretty dang important to you too. And it's impossible for humans to perfectly optimize every minute of our day. We're humans. We're not robots. And so we can't hold ourselves to this impossible standard. But it is possible to be a little bit more thoughtful and intentional with where your time is going each and every day. And if it's being used in a way that feels good and rewarding and meaningful, that is what ultimately matters. So if you are in a season and you're like, I haven't evaluated how my time is being spent That's when it's so easy for us to be on autopilot and to end up wasting minutes and hours of our week on things that don't truly matter or that we don't want to be spending our time on. And so my encouragement as we close out is for you to take an audit of where your time is going and then try implementing one or even a few of these steps into your weekly rhythm to see if you feel less pulled in a million directions and instead can experience this more peaceful flow within your work and your personal life. Time is our currency. We have to spend it well and know that I am fighting right alongside of you to figure out how we can do just that. Thank you so much, Gold Diggers, for listening to another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Of course, until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com.